Welcome back everyone! In today's video I will show you how I made the final piece for my Bregenzerwald Tracht, the Juppe or dress. This costume is part of my What My Ancestors Wore series, where I recreate costumes my genetical ancestors may have worn. In this chapter I'm recreating the Bregenzerwald costume, a costume that's one of the oldest in Europe that's still being worn today. If you want to see the rest of the videos in this series, I created a playlist that I linked up here and down below. The Juppe emerged around the 15th century from the early medieval work dress. Around this time it was made from white linen, later brown, but under the influence of Spanish fashion around the 17th century it became black. At that time wearing black was a status symbol, as dyeing black was very expensive and it required a lot of re-dyes to keep up the quickly fading color. By the way, it's pronounced as Juppe, but I may by mistake pronounce it as Jupe sometimes because I learned French. The Juppe is unique for every single woman, as it cannot be just bought, it's either tailor-made or inherited. The Juppe comes with a red, black or more rarely brown bodice. In case of the red bodice, the neckline is decorated with a dark blue or black embroidered ribbon. I was a bit worried about curving the ribbon around the corners so neatly, so I decided to embroider it in the shape of the neckline. And for that, I first had to figure out the bodice. I started by draping fabric out of the lino and drawing out my design. Once I was happy with it, I made a mock-up and then I transferred the pattern onto paper and scanned it in. I traced the pattern and started designing the embroidery around the neckline of the bodice with the help of some photos of the Vorarlberg embroidery. They use a lot of floral designs in elegant muted colors, framed and accentuated by golden thread. I used a dense, full loden like fabric to embroider on and embroidered the two front pieces and the back piece separately, so it fit in my embroidery hoops. Although the design wasn't very big, it had a lot of color changes, and it took quite a while to complete. So meanwhile the machine was clicking away, I had time to figure out the skirt. Probably the most iconic part of the Juppe is its huge pleated skirt. The skirt is made in four steps, dyeing, gluing, giving it a shine, and pleating. It's made from linen fabric that, according to tradition, is boiled hard and shiny, wrung out and spread on the lawn to dry. The glue, that's a mixture of leather glue, per glue and paint, gives the fabric a very smooth and hard texture. They apply the finish on a single carefully selected day of the year. Then it's pleated using machines that are around 100 years old, giving the 5 meter long fabric around 5 to 600 folds. After this process, the fabric is hung up for around 6 months to settle the folds. It takes about a year and a half 
from order to finish shoot and the process consists of about 150 to 170 work hours and various artisans are involved in the creation of a single costume. The dress is still made today in the Jukpenwerkstatt, that's both a museum and a business, making a couple of dresses every year and where I really hope to visit one day. So, as far as I can see, there are three ways I could make this skirt. One, I could just buy a pre-pleated fabric. But the problem with that is that companies don't really sell pre-pleated organic fabrics because they lose their pleats after one wash. You usually can find like muslin or tulle or satin maybe, but it's not really the finish I like. My second option is to buy my own fabric and take it to a company that would pleat it for me. The only problem with this is that it's usually pretty costly and it would easily triple my fabric expenses. My last option is probably the most obvious. I could just make it myself. The only problem with that is that it will take so long. <laughs> After a bit of deliberation, I chose option 3 for one reason only. Wouldn't it be cool if I learned how to pleat by hand? There is one issue though. The yuppe is pleated in the accordion or standing pleat style. There are two styles of pleating. The plissé, where the folds overlap each other, or the gouvré, where they stand next to each other. And although I have pleated fabric before into the plissé, I don't even know how to start on the gouvré. As I was researching this, pretty much unsuccessfully, I kept thinking, there are so many cultures with this type of pleated skirt. They must have had a way to do this at home by hand, without the help of a machine. And then, just out of the blue, I found this report of a lady from the remote area of Hungary showing how she makes her skirts. You don't know how excited I was. And now I've been putting off doing it for days now because I'm so nervous that I will spend like a week doing this and it won't even turn out nice like it won't be even or it won't be it or it won't take the pleats at all and it will just unravel when I undo the stitches I know it will definitely not look like the machine made ones but my hope is that it will be at least close enough well, luckily, I can still procrastinate a bit because I have to sew on this blue ribbon around knee height and hem the bottom of the fabric before I pleat it. The fabric that I'm using is an old cotton bed sheet. Unfortunately, pure linen is a bit out of my budget for me at the moment, but this will do. Once that was all done, there was nothing left to procrastinate with, so I had to start the pleating process. In the video I found, the lady suggested to start with the thickest part of the skirt, so I started by pleating off the ribbon I saw in. The process is actually quite easy. You pick up a couple of folds with your fingers, not more than 5 or 6 at a time. Then you hold the folds in one hand and drive a needle with a thick thread through the middle of them with the other hand. And that's it. For the first row, it's just that simple. All you have to pay attention to is that you need to keep the folds equal sizes and even.
Now that you are done with the first door, you will want to add another thread a couple inches away from the first one. The lady in the video had only a couple in her skirt, but I'm not as experienced as she is. And I'm also very nervous, so I added a row every couple of inches. The second row and the rest of them are a bit trickier because you really really have to pay attention that you pick up the same number and size of folds as you previously did. Otherwise you might lose some folds and that extra fabric will be added to its neighboring fold that will become way too big. I admit, I was worried that it would be a long and tedious job, and I was right in a way, but I wouldn't say it wasn't fun. I'd compare it to knitting, if anything, where every night I'd sit down to watch something, I'd work on it a little on the coffee table. It's something you can do on basically autopilot, relax while your fingers do the plating. It took me about a week worth of evenings to finish it, but it was so satisfying to see it come together and slowly transform this huge 3 meters of fabric into about half a meter of pleats. And now it's time to set the splits once and for all. So I tried every technique I ever heard of. I sprayed it just slightly with some water that had a teeny bit of cornstarch in it while I was still pleating. Then I steamed it on both sides. Then it was time to iron it, even though I was so afraid of ruining everything with that. But the lady in the video said so, so it had to be done. <laughs> I pressed the folds towards one side and ironed them using a lot of steam and some more light water spraying. I'm pretty sure this is actually an overkill, as the lady in the video said that when they used to work with silk brocade, as you can't really wet or iron that delicate fabric, they just used to leave it out on the grass overnight and the dew in the morning would be enough to set the pleats in. But after all this work, I just couldn't trust the dew to do it. So I ironed it from both sides and then I hung it up to dry for a couple of weeks while I made the petticoat and the crown for this costume. Now that the skirt was mostly done, I can go back to working on the bodice. The original is made from Loden, a super thick felted and boiled wood from the Tyrol area. As that's not really available around these parts, I use something called Duftin instead, as it has a similar weight and texture. Now that the embroidery was done, I also cut those pieces out. Then matching them up to their respective bodice pieces, I pinned them on right side to the wrong side of the red fabric. I did this so when I sew them together and flip them to the right side of the bodice piece, it will hide the raw edges under itself. Before turning, I clipped and trimmed the seam allowance very close, then I trimmed the bottom edge of the embroidered fabric and top stitched it down. I did not worry too much of the finishing of that edge, as it is quite a nice dense fabric that shouldn't fray too much, and even if it does, the stitching will stop it for sure. Then I sew the shoulder and side seams together. On the interior I opened the seams up and cross stitched them down on their edges. I also folded the middle opening back and basted it down. On one side I had to use a bias tape. The 
The back of the bodice is adorned with three knotted gold laces called kiadoha to hide the seams. Originally, I thought these were embroidered ribbons, so that's how I made them. Later on though, I found out that these are actually freestanding hand-knotted laces made from actual gold thread. I'm slowly starting to understand how a full shop can cost up to 2,500 euros. So, I designed my embroidery and with more or less success, I embroidered it onto red organza ribbons using water-soluble stabilizer. Then I hand sewed them onto the shoulder seams and the mid back. I also searched the lower edge of the bodice to prevent fraying. I used some homemade red bias tape to finish the armholes. I sewed it on right side spacing and trimmed the excess fabric. I had to be really careful with the duftin as it's quite a thick material and it's really easy to create bulk in the seams. Then I felt the other edge down by hand. The last piece for this costume I have to make is the bleats, a richly embroidered flat piece of fabric women tuck into the neckline of their bodice. I designed mine in PE, pulling inspiration from various excellent garments, and then I embroidered it onto the same red duftin I made the bodice from. Once the embroidery was ready, I cut out the shape I saw on many of the museum pieces. Then blankets stitched around the edges to prevent fraying. Now that everything was ready, I had no more excuses and had to attach the skirt to the bodice. I was sort of avoiding this as I knew that it would be fiddly work, as I by mistake only used 3 meters of fabric instead of the 5 meters real ships use. I first pinned the fabrics together, right sides facing, spreading the folds as evenly as I could. Then I basted them together with tiny hand stitches.
for some extra security, I also sewed them together by machine. Then I closed up the middle seam. Originally, I used hooks and snaps to close the bodice, but last minute I changed it from overlapping to mid-closure to reduce bulk. And the last, but most nerve-wracking step, removing the threads that kept the pleats together and praying that the folds will hold. But before I show you how the pleats came out, let's talk about what else you will need to finish off the look. The yuppe is worn with long sleeve blouse underneath, with black stockings and a traditional black shoes. There is a blue kerchief tucked into the neckline, I presume to prevent staining of the bodice. And the black jupe is worn with a blue apron. In case of the white jupe though, they forgo the apron and wear it with a lacquered black belt that has beautiful filigree casps in the back. Since moisture damages the lacquered linen, it's always worn with a petticoat underneath and ventilated well after taking it off. In colder months, the costume can also be worn with a shorter black jacket, a cape with fringes, or the light mantel, a black or blue pleated cloak that's open on the right side. Before we go into the reveal though, I have to admit that I did not adhere to a couple of these instructions as we are having a heat wave right now and it's like 36 degrees outside and I just could not fathom the idea of wearing long sleeves or even just black stockings.